and we are live yo my peoples what's up yo the board gaming revolution community uh i am your host jason from the shelf stories youtube channel thank you so so much for stopping by for this nice uh new feature that we're trying you know uh, live interviews uh, nothing that we've you know really sunk our teeth into but we're going to try this as a model uh, so I am from Shelf Stories. I do interviews and all sorts of stuff on my YouTube channel. And we have a very fun feature for you this evening. So we have Katia Howardson on the show. She is a mod. So hopefully you have not run afoul of her moderations. <laughs> <laughs> or you've had some pleasant experiences, which is much more likely. She has a Kickstarter right now going uh, on uh, the board game Mosaic Calendar. So you've probably heard about it. You've probably seen a lot of posts, but we figured this would be a good time to you know, step back. The, the uh, project is ending fairly soon within the next week or so. You have a lot uh, right to get that in there, uh, a late pledge. But before I uh, flap my gums any longer, let me go ahead and invite Katia to welcome you to the show. Well, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, the project that I have on Kickstarter currently is uh, it's not just for a calendar, but it is the main part of it. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a calendar where I've partnered with 13 publishers altogether to uh, create mosaics that represent some of their games. And that becomes your image for the month. Um, so every month you'll be seeing a mosaic that represents a different game. And uh, at the end of the calendar, there's a 10 by 10 challenge page for people to do because it's a gamer's calendar. So it has that in it. And it also has spaces to write um, the games that you played every month. And it has like a description of the publisher that's featured every month as well. You can look them up, you know, their their store online. Um, and these are real publishers, people. This is Lucky Duck. This is Chip Theory. What are some of the other publishers that have contributed to this program? Um, we have Renegade in there, Renegade Games, um, Elf Creek Games, Floodgate Games. Uh, my goodness, Wise Wizard. Who else is in there? Thunderworks. Um, right. Publishers oh, you've heard of, people. This is yeah, the, this is about Grand the creme de la creme. There's going to be the 10 by 10 challenge. There's, um, my goodness, who else did I do? You lose track. Mythic games. Right. Yeah. So it's a okay, big, so, uh, it's a big mm -hmm. lineup this year for sure. So we are going to get into, you know, just talking about it, uh, you know, the promo, obviously, you know, what KTSA said was true. There's more to it and we'll have a lot more discussion about it. So we're going to talk about the project. We're going to talk about just KTS art, which is what it, which is what inspired this whole thing. Right. Um, you know, the, the, um, the posts and the, you know, the, the different things that you would do and people who are very attention grabbing, like, Ooh, I don't, I've never seen this before. So like we talk a little bit about that. So we're going to talk about the, you know, the, the, the project and the art and everything. And then we'll get a little bit, you know, in the second half of the interview, talk about Katia. If anybody's out there, we we absolutely invite you to, you know, type stuff in the comments. I think uh, Thomas is uh, in the background. He is our MC for the evening in the back. Uh, so whenever we get a comment, well, he'll pop it in the private chat and I'll uh, try to weave that into the discussion. Uh, okay. So uh, there we go. I, I think uh, we popped up on that thing. This is my first time running a stream, by the way. I'm so used to doing nice, safe podcast. I can edit. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we're all kind of uh, figuring out, figuring our way. All right. So, um, so we started to get into the project. We started to get into what it is. Let's, um, but let's walk it back a little bit. Let's talk about just the mosaic project in general and where that idea came from. To, um, and I think this was a question. I'm going to get it from Christine Wright, who asked us a couple of days ago, in terms of the inspiration to create art, to create mosaics from game components. Where did that come from? Um, well, it started a while ago. Like over a year ago now, um, I, I used to do a lot of the guess your guess what game the component the components were from like posts um, on Facebook. So like in Board Game Revolution, I would uh, you know line up some components and then have people guess what game they were from. And then um, so did you do the thing where you would like put different components from different games and mess people yeah, up? <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, then eventually it started as you know. Uh, I did like a candy cane for Christmas and uh, like at Valentine's Day, I think I did a heart. And so it sort of like transitioned to becoming images. Um, but mainly it was like when when COVID hit in the spring of uh, 2020 that um, I it was one of those things where I just started noticing that everybody was, you know, locked down and um, the feed of the group was 
less, uh, you know, less mm. active, less positive than it used to be because everybody was, you know, being forced to stay home. Um, so I just, I one day decided, okay, well, why don't I do a name the game post and I'll, I'll actually make something with it, like an image. And um, that's so that just came where, from just being kind of, but not bored, but, but let's yeah, get I, more in there. Yeah. Yeah. Because at that point, like I had, I had some, um, I mean, there were doubts around my, my work. I didn't know if I was going to be able to continue working uh, during the pandemic. Uh, we transitioned to Zoom, but um, yeah, the summer, I mean, the summer of 2020 for me was super, super quiet in terms of work. So that's sort right. of where I started to dive into the artwork. And um, it was it was suggested to do a calendar. So that's, you know, sort of where I took, I took that direction and then mm -hmm. decided to run with it. Well, um, I can, so I remember that. I remember when you started, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember... Um, I think Honey Buzz was an early one, I think. Uh, that was from this year, actually. Was that from this year? Okay. Yeah, last You're going to have to year. film me in. Because there were, there were some, because, you know, they got really elaborate. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, yes. So, and then I, we have a question um, about that, but maybe you could talk a little about, like, some of the specific ones you started with and that, that really caught people's eye. Yeah, the ones I started with, so I had done the, I did the BGR logo. Um, I had done um, Board Game Shot. Uh, the guy who does the board game photography, Mateus from right. uh, Europe, I did his logo just for fun, and then I and then I was approached by Gameland to to do their logo at the time, and then to run a giveaway with them to try and you know grow my channel. So it was something like really fun that they thought, hey, you know, we'll help you out, and you can give away one of our games, and so. Um, Very cool. So I did that, yeah, and then afterwards I did I did a bunch of mandalas as well. Those were, yeah, just basically me digging into my games, finding cool components that I thought would work well together, and then building a mandala from there. So I did a bunch of those. And if and you then, remember... Yeah, whenever um, I would post mm -hmm. them, it was always, you know, guess what game these are from. And so it's, you know, it's nice to make it sort of like a game for people to, to guess. And again, right, this was during the pandemic, so this was when people weren't able to game with their groups anymore. So it was sort of like a way to bring the fun online. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, so that's how it started. And then from yeah. there, you, it just became, <laughs> if you remember back in, I, I'm not sure exactly when this happened, this is the same Katia from the quote unquote Katia challenge. So you know how many games she has a lot. <laughs> she has I a actually, lot to work with. Well, okay. So it's funny because I don't, I don't see my collection as being that big. It is bigger now because the publishers that have teamed up with me to do the calendar, um, you know, have sent copies so that mm -hmm. I have the component of the game that I'm about to represent because that's something that's important to me is when I do a piece of art about a game, you know, if it's been commissioned by a publisher, obviously I want that game to have its pieces in there somewhere, not all of them, but as much as I can fit, you know, within the design. So, um, so yes, my collection grew a little bit, but I... I mean, compared to a lot of gamers out there, I don't have, like, mm. I don't have a thousand games. That's just not even, it's not even close to that. Once um, you get over I a couple have, hundred, that's, that's so I funny. have a few <laughs> hundred, and, and I'm getting almost to a point where it's uncomfortably, it's, it's yeah, like, mm -hmm. we don't play the ones that, that like, I, I feel like I'm at a point where we learn a game and then the next time we play it, we almost have to reread the rules again. So yep. it's getting to that point where it's a little uncomfortable, but um, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's more components to use. So it's a good thing. And mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, so we can get back. Yeah. Get back to the component deal. So like it took off and then when, it, at what point did you decide I want to take the next step and make a, make a, a Kickstarter out of this? So, People, so people were asking, hey, have you thought of doing a calendar or hey, have you thought of putting these on shirts? And I mean, shirts is like is an endeavor that I was not ready to dive into. Um, so and in the calendar, I, at first I thought, yeah, but nobody uses those anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm bringing the calendars back. No, that's right. <laughs> but it was, yeah, it was a project. I thought, I don't know if it's going to take off. And, and, um, I had some support from, uh, from Gamelin, obviously like at the beginning and, um, 
uh, Nathan Hatfield from Gamelin Games was, you know, what's encouraging me to basically take the leap. You know, it's like, you know, you'll have to, you'll have to find a manufacturer, uh, you know, fulfillment company, but it's like, you know, if you need help, uh, you know, I'll help you out. And basically sort of like pushed me to try and uh, yeah, and do a Kickstarter. So I looked into, okay, what kind of other products could I offer? Because I don't want to just make it a calendar because then it might not do as well. So right. that's when I decided to approach um, Jamie Stagmeyer to ask about wingspan if i could do wingspan coasters so mm -hmm. um basically we you know he had an agreement and it's you know we'll call them wingspan inspired coasters and then we just make sure that we say it's not an official stone meyer product um that it's something that i that i made it's not like he's endorsing the product or you know like mm -hmm. pushing sales or anything like that like it's separate yeah. um but yeah, so I then I looked into yeah I looked into the coasters I looked into doing some magnets and um, yeah obviously prints was a big was something that people wanted so I included that as well and um, yeah that's when I decided okay well like let's do this <laughs> <laughs> like partly one of the scariest thing I've had to do because you feel you definitely feel the pressure once it like once you hit that like okay it's live. It's like oh my god here we go um and yeah you feel you definitely feel a lot of pressure to uh like to deliver your product to your your customers the people who bought the, your backers like you want to make sure that there's no hiccups and um yeah it was just, it's it's really stressful really stressful but when i started seeing posts of people receiving their product, like receiving the calendar, receiving the magnets, and how excited they were, that was like, so cool. this, is, this is the best. Woo! All right, thank but you. It was, it was so nice when mm -hmm. it, like people were sharing the pictures, and I was like, oh, like this is something I made, and somebody in the UK has it, somebody in Australia has one of those. Like it was just, it was mind blowing to me that it made it that far, and yeah, it, yeah. So that's why I decided to do it all over again this year. So, so uh, Shannon Pepitone just chimed in on the comment. Uh, this has been a little bit too fast for me to read it, but I did have a question from her that came a couple of days ago. Uh, Shannon asked, what is the size of some of the artwork when it's done? Okay. Uh, you know, they've gotten bigger and more detailed. So, I, I mean, we see your bedroom back there. And that is, the believe me, uh, uh, KT wanted to hide the, the laundry basket. I'm like, no, put the laundry basket right there. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, don't. it's not a big palatial bedroom. How much of that bedroom floor or workspace do your uh, mosaics take? So, I actually, I'm, um, I'm, I do it in the, in the guest bedroom downstairs. Um, and I have a table... It's 34 inches by 34 inches. And I have art pieces that I have almost mm. gotten to the edge. There are some that sometimes get to the edges on the, you know, on this way, but not this way. And um, yeah, it's, I mean, there, there have been some, which one is it that I did recently? Oh, the too many bones. Um, Was it gasket? Was so it, I had or gilly? Gilly. So yes. I had started in the middle you know like kind of with his hair and then worked my way down and because 34 inches is pretty long like i can't miss it's almost three reach. feet yeah or yeah. what do you what do you say in canada i know you don't use feet uh it's meter so it'd be like Something. a meter and change i don't know yeah like about mm -hmm. a, yeah like <laughs> a yard in football it's like it's pretty, like pretty big yeah <laughs> so when um uh, when i started making that piece and i had like my my husband's phone was up top taking the time lapse and um i realized that when i was looking at the size of the piece and the image that's on the little too many bones map i realized i'm i'm running out of room at the bottom and on the left so i had to go and cut up another piece of cardboard and add some more white cardboard on the side and at the bottom and then i had to push the whole thing as close to the wall as i could basically to maximize my surface because I was running out of room. Like it, it didn't seem like a big piece, but because he had like a bow and arrow this way, his feet were down here. Like it just, it grew out of my space that I had set up. So, but yeah, that's the biggest they can be right now. It's 34 by 34. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I got another question over here. Um, 
just I guess this was a more, more general question about art in games. Like, I mean, what do you think in general about uh, this from Will Jones? Uh, what do you think in general about art in like recent art games? And and who is your favorite board game artist? Um, well, one of my favorite board game artists would be the Miko. I am a huge fan of, uh, what, of what work has what work has uh, the Miko done? Um, the Raiders of the North Sea, Architects of the West, West Kingdom, Paladins, oh, okay. uh, mm -hmm. the Claim games. All the Valeria King, um, Valeria Card Kingdom games, like all of all of those are his, and um, I just I love his I love his style. Um, aside from that, I mean I don't know, like I I love um, well the one board game that was just on Kickstarter, um, Transmission. The artist is Matt Matt Dixon. He draws these little robots that are absolutely adorable, and uh, I have prints at home and. Uh, when I saw that that was going to become a board game, it was the first time that I was just insta back, you know. <laughs> that was a no brainer right. for me. I was like, I don't even care what the game is about. I need those little robots. Um, <laughs> I got over that pretty quickly. I've been doing this, I've been uh, in hobby gaming and backing projects, I think since 2015 or 16. And yeah, those, those games didn't stick around <laughs> where I was just like, oh, I'm going to get this. Oh, man, what did I get? Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, I, I heard the gameplay is good, so I'm relieved. But yeah, that was that was just a no brainer, just because of the art. I'm I, I love love Matt Dixon's art. Um, but I mean, otherwise, like I don't necessarily I don't have a lot of favorites per se. But there's definitely a draw for me to get a game when the art is really really appealing. Reed Decker wants you ask if you will ever do shirt shirts. <laughs> so <sure>. yeah. <laughs> Probably in the future at some point. Um, shirts are really, uh, they're difficult to do, um, especially, so there's a few challenges with my art in terms of uh, putting those onto shirts. Uh, first of all is that I use, yeah, like I have a black background or a white background typically. And um, so that means that if you want the design on a blue shirt, you will still get my the background I had in between the pieces. You will right. still see that on the blue shirt. So it it might not look right. I haven't fully explored, you know, what options, like if whether, you know, it would have to be inside like a, a frame or like a box or some kind. Um, the other thing too is like the process of, of printing that would be used, like what would be the most detailed because you don't want to lose what the pieces are once you put it on a shirt because that kind of loses you know part of its magic i think right it's um, like when you get a tattoo of something it sounds like a great idea it's like i'm gonna get a tattoo of this intricate thing and then he shows people it's like what is happening that, there? that is too much going on it yeah. was supposed to be a panther and it turned into just kind of this red blah <laughs> You have to be really careful with your art. You can't it just can't just go on any medium. Well, and that yeah, that's the thing. It can't go on everything. Like I wouldn't be able to do blankets with my art because you yeah, you would lose all the detail. Um, but I mean, it's something that I'm definitely trying to look into. But it yeah, it's difficult because also like having you know like you have to use some kind of pre-order system where people pick sizes and and you can't offer too many different designs because they charge you per design so you know like if you offer 20 different ones and you only get you know three people want this design then that's costing you a lot of money to just make those three shirts so like for those who aren't familiar with with shirt printing i've done it a little bit in the past for something else and that's the thing is that you need the quantities to make it worthwhile right. so uh, that's sort of where, like, I, I don't know. I don't know when shirts will happen, but I'm hoping that at some point I can figure something out. So, so Reed Decker is going to have to get busy recruiting uh, and, and get some <laughs> get some critical mass going. Nicholas Brulette asks, do you have to buy several copies of a game for the pieces? Do you put the pieces back in the games they come from or leave them for the next piece? So at the moment and in the past few months, um, the pieces that I take out, stay out so i have so that bedroom downstairs the bed is like full of baggies of pieces and containers of pieces uh my treadmill is covered in games and baggies as well so oh you like, you don't need that treadmill for anything you're good right <laughs> <laughs> it's starting to 
could get nice outside. I could just go for a walk or exactly. bike ride or whatever. But uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't currently put them back, but normally, yes, I would try and clean up after I've done a mosaic. Um, I don't buy duplicates of games. If you see a piece that has more components than the actual game has, it's because the publisher has sent extras. Mm. I have had a few publishers that have sent me a box of components and, you know, spare parts from their replacement that they no longer need or whatever. And then they send that to me and I have little cubbies, little compartments. I put those in. So that's how I'm able to have more color variations and more choices as well, because, um, yeah, that's definitely something that I'm noticing is like, I, I'm, there are certain colors I need more components of. So it's handy when a publisher is like, oh, yeah, I don't need those anymore. I'll just send them to you. Perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, and and we're, we're to the wise about this stuff in terms of content creation. Uh, publishers will work with you if you offer them something of value. You know, like, I mean, if you talk about it on a podcast, if you talk about it on a stream, if you, you know, like, like Katie is doing it. And the reason I'm excited about this thing is like Katie is really changing the paradigm of what games are all about. I mean, games aren't just there to be pl played. And if they're not played, they're useless. No, <laughs> I mean, there's all sorts of things. And we're really opening the space and publishers are willing to work with that. So if anybody out there has an idea, if anybody out there has, you know, something um, that just will great, create visibility, make people happy. You know, a publisher mm -hmm. might just work with you if you maybe not the one that you're looking for specifically, but like there's, you know, like Gamelin Games and, you know, and Dreddy Gay, these is like a million publishers out there that will work with and, you. And that's the thing, too, is when I reached out uh, last year to the publishers, you know, I basically picked publishers that I thought, you know, were good publishers that, hey, let's reach out, see if they're, they're willing to partner to do this calendar. So, and this was like a new project that, you know, it, it's a, in a way, it's a risk for them, you know, like they're incurring a, an expense and they don't know, like, if it's going to even turn out, right? So, um, so they took a chance and um, basically, you know, I was offering them to do their logos and their mm -hmm. you know, mosaic for one of their games. So they were getting that back in return, you know, to use, um, you know, however they want. But um, yeah, I mean, if you come up with something I think that is unique, um, publishers will get behind that because it's, yeah. And, and, and I mean, that was one of the reason why um, we have the one giveaway on BGR right now for the, um, the chip theory game is mm -hmm. chip theory said, you know, it's your project is unique. So let's do a giveaway to try and promote it some more. And so people can go on BGR right now because I think it ends tomorrow and they can guess how many components were used in the Gilly piece to try and win a chip theory game. But a yeah, lot. It was a lot. A lot. Yeah, I them. <laughs> Don't get 17. Don't do it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I think when I think when you come up with something that's original and like you say that the publishers will get something back in return and they're they're happy to to partner with you and, and to do something cool. So. Yeah, it, it, we're we're breaking them. We're breaking forward. Like do cool things. They said does, you don't just have to have it at game night or whatever it is. Do cool things. These are toys at the end mm -hmm. of the day. So we definitely want to be. You know that this whole podcast. I was talking with Kate about the show. It's about sharing happy things, and you know we can we can really bust our minds and be happy about a lot of different things in a lot of different ways. Um, so we are going to transition to talk about, you know, you as a person and share, you know, maybe there's not a lot of people that know, like they see Katia and they see the challenges and they see the, the post, but maybe they don't know, know a little bit about you. But before we do that, uh, is there anything else that we should know about the project that like, I'm hearing something about stretch goals. I'm hearing, you know, uh, yeah, like there are other things that are coming as the, as the project kind of rolls to a close. Let's get people excited. Yes. So uh, like I was saying earlier, it's not just a calendar this year. There are coffee mugs or, you know, hot beverage mugs. Um, there are magnets again. There's prints. There's an enamel pin. And I feel like I'm forgetting something. Is there a mystery big fat stretch goal coming up? Coming up? Or did that get reached already? Okay. So I have something in mind for if we reach a thousand packers, which mm. is doable because I'm – almost at like i'm less than 20 backers away from the amount i had last year when the project ended and there's still a whole week left so mm. 
I think it's doable. <laughs> I think we can get to a thousand. We're doing and, the best and, we can. Yeah. And then, yes, I will. I will throw in something for uh, for the backers. Um, but yes, I think we're momentarily about to unlock something that is basically going to be a surprise in the pledge manager for people to see. Um, if if it, it's sort of coded in a, in a little. Not a riddle, but it's sort of coded on the page for a reason. And when people open the pledge manager, then they'll see they'll see it there. Um, but yes, I have a few other things in store for the next, you know, milestones that we reach. But my goal is to yeah to get to a thousand so I can give what it is that I want to give to people. Very nice. We can't, can't wait. So that's the board game mosaic calendar project. If you have a question about it, please, you know, we're going to be on here for another 30 minutes or so. So just, you know, put it in the comments, uh, you know, we're, we're willing to kind of jump back and forth, but we're, we're going to transition a little bit. We have a couple of questions. Reed pop back in just kind of like, no, you know, let's get to know Katia. Right. Uh, so Reed asked, do you have cats? I can't <laughs> imagine trying to make art like this with cats. I don't, I don't have cats. <laughs> and if I did, I would just close the door. I, basically, if I did, they wouldn't be allowed in the basement. It would be like, this is mm. the space where all is a mess, you know? Or any small thing. Like, I have small children. There's no way I could do this with small children. No way. Yeah, I mean, we don't, yeah, we don't have, um, no. Nope. Oh, no, 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 no. He's, he's got my dog in here. And, and he's also not allowed in that. There he is. No. <laughs> we have an interactive show over here. The husband's like, you want a cat? <laughs> I'm going to see your cat and he's raise a, you a dog. <laughs> he's the size of a cat, but uh, he's still very young, so he's not even allowed in that Ooh. area either because he. I just don't want him to like eat anything that he's not supposed to. Mm. Um, but no, I don't have cats. So nothing can threaten the, the, the art. What's the art? I don't right. have cats. I don't have kids. So we're good. Got it. <laughs> All right, so uh, this was from a couple of days ago. Lance, uh, Lane Ardell, I imagine this is a Canuck-driven question because you are from Canada, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, right outside of Toronto? Yes, I'm right outside. Of, I was born in Quebec, but I'm now right outside of Toronto, like about an hour and a bit from Toronto. Parlez-vous Francais? Yes, yes, I do. That's <laughs> all I got. That's all I got, people. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I got. <laughs> Uh, what is your worst snowball related injury that you have had or had or caused? Snowball? Yes. I don't know. Um, I mean, I don't think I've had any. Well, no, it wouldn't be snowball related, but I mean, I've I've taken some spills on skis before mm. um, and kind of tweaked my knee. Aside from that, I don't like. I don't recall ever being hurt by a snowball, and I think. I don't think I was in a lot of snowball fights to begin with. I think most of us used to just go s skating or sledding or, uh, yeah, I don't remember a lot of uh, hostility in terms of. Uh, yeah, that's an American thing. <laughs> is it? We're the ones that like to throw things. <laughs> yeah, it's You got too much sporting and outdoor stuff going on. <laughs> you can't oh, yeah, ski in the middle of Brooklyn, New York. Get out of here. Yeah, we don't throw things. <laughs> I threw stuff all. The Ask me that question. <laughs> yeah, I I actually I grew up skating quite a bit. Just like that was the thing we did in winter. We just walked to the ice rink and then spent you know a Saturday there or spend the evening there because they had the lights on, so you could just do it all evening. And I just that that's the one thing I remember doing a lot as a kid when it was yeah in the winter time. But well, thank you, Michael, uh, for for picking your head in. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, I'm having a lot of fun. Uh, I hope KT is having a lot of fun too with this conversation. A little bit nervous at the beginning. You were saying before, but like, come on, yeah. it's just talking. It's just we're doing our thing. We're good. <laughs> um, so maybe tell us a little bit about how you got into gaming. I mean, did you get to know? Uh, I mean, did, were you gaming from a very very young age? Was it with your family? Was it with your friends? How'd you start? Yeah, I started gaming basically as a kid with my sister. Um, we played, you know, we had Monopoly, we had a game called Gambler. And I remember that game because it has like a really, really loud contraption that has dice in there. And what's funny is that it's a kid's game, but it, it actually encouraged you to gamble. Uh, <laughs> you had to bet on like the dice, how they were going to fall in that thing. So you'd shake it and it was the loudest thing in the whole 
house, I think. And um, so we grew up playing that. We grew up playing a lot of card games, speed, uh, whatever, mm -hmm. like those. Yeah. Um, what else did we play? Like we, I remember we had a game, and this is funny because I've been trying to find what that game was called, and I think we got it for free with something. And it was a game where it was actually like you traveled around the world and you had language cards. And it was almost like set collection from what I recall because the cards had different colors on them. And um, yeah, I have no idea what it was called, but it was so cool because you got to learn what other languages are around the world. And mm. we're still pretty young. We were playing that. So I thought that was kind of neat. And what else did we play? We had... Um, I mean, snakes and ladder. We had a snake and ladder um, game. We had, gosh, like I played waterworks with my grandma on the mm -hmm. floor of her apartment to the point where we like laid the, the cards down and it reached the patio door. And then we had to like go onto the patio to keep playing our game of, uh, of waterworks because it's like it's a pipeline and then it has leaks and stuff that you're trying to fix. And it builds this network and we were just spreading out and like that was with my grandma. So I like I definitely grew up gaming quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would say maybe like high school, you continue to play card games. And then in college, like I wasn't playing anything uh, focused on studies pretty much. And um, yeah, it was in I think 2008 where um my husband's cousin introduced us to i think it was dominion or something like we we mm -hmm. got introduced to dominion and then um Kit the dual Catan duel the two-player one and then it sort of grew from there like we got back into gaming and then discovered how many board games were out there and it's been like yeah since 2008 so yeah 2008 was the year like i mean pandemic came out uh dominion came out Agricola had come, had been imported, and these are like seminal games, right? So if you like, that was the time if you were going to come in there, like you really the, striking while the iron was hot, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you know, just uh, moving on, you know, I think one of the things we wanted to explore uh, as we moved in, it's like you know, being a, a female in the gaming space, you know, in Canada, obviously, you know, local, going to cons and you know, interacting with folks. And now we have this all this online stuff, uh, which has definitely changed the game, uh, you know. Yeah. Is that uh you know because 2008 was a was we're talking 13 years? I know. I know. <laughs> I feel old. That's <laughs> <laughs> a lot of time. Uh, I mean, just I guess talk about uh, from your position, like the the progression, you know, wow. uh, of of women in gaming. You know, the, from then to now, how how do you feel? Uh, you know, like observing that process. Do you feel you know evaluate well, that? A bit? Yeah, it's interesting because. Like when I got back into gaming was around the same time that my sister got back into gaming as well. And um, so I, I always kind of had that female, you know. Right. Um, so, helpful. so helpful. That was, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, we're, you know, women game too. But then as, yeah, when I joined Board Game Revolution online and when I started yeah, using social media more than it. I think it really hit me how much more male dominated the the, the industry was, and um, yeah, the lack of female designers and like that. That's something that still uh, it's so it's it's shocking at the same time, and it's and it's saddening at the same time because like I I. When people say, oh, who's your favorite game designer, right? Like, right off the bat, you can name, like, 10 or 12 male designers. Mm -hmm. And there's Elizabeth Argrave, <laughs> who's <laughs> almost by herself with the, like, with the group of designers that everybody knows uh, off the top of their head. Like, I We love like you, Nikki Valens. <laughs> that's the thing, is that there are so much more, but... Mm -hmm. Um, they're either, you know, unknown or they, they haven't published as many. So I feel like people just don't remember the names or don't, don't pay attention to the box cover, you know, who designed this. I don't know, but it feels like we're so, we're such a small group in this gaming community. 
Um, but I have seen over, you know, over the last few years, even like I've seen when I go to my game store, there's a lot of women in there. Mm -hmm. And when we first started going to shop there, it was always guys. Um, it was, I think there was one woman who worked there and I think now they have more than one, uh, because there's somebody last time I went, it was somebody new and it was, it was a woman as well. So, um, yeah, there's definitely, there's definitely more women that are entering the hobby as well as gamers and as designers too. So it's nice to see the shift, but at first, like going to my first convention two years ago, yeah, there's a lot of guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of guys. It's a lot of guys. Um, but I mean, I I think I've been fortunate in a way. Like I haven't had too many bad experiences where, um, you know, people assume that I'm not a very skilled gamer because I'm a woman or anything like that. Um, you know, there's there's been a little like a few instances of you know the mansplaining mm -hmm. <laughs> where, where people just go above and beyond and you're like yep yeah, yep yeah, no i i know what you mean like i i played a ton of games like i, I know where you're going yeah. with this yep yep and then they still continue to explain it thoroughly and thoroughly and it's like yes <laughs> um i yeah i mean that i think has happened a couple times um i mean at the game store there are times where i felt like um a little bit like i was being preached to in a way um but other otherwise like things haven't been too bad for me uh, thankfully but uh has the opposite happened have you had you know people kind of lay out the red carpet and say hey you know uh come in and that kind of I thing i think so i think so yes um i think that especially now there's because there's starting to be that shift i think people are making that extra step um to be welcoming to women i think uh, certain people in the industry are making a point to be our allies and try and help us and push us along to, to you know, get us uh, on the same level, you know, so that if we want to design a game that we, you know, have the same support that they did because, you know, they all had each other, um, you know, to, to help with feedback, to help uh, develop games. And so when a woman enters the space, then it's like, I don't, I don't necessarily have a lot of connections, you know, so it's, so it's nice to have, to have allies in, in the industry. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of where I'm starting to head is, is game design. So it's, yeah, I've definitely, I, I've felt very welcome um, by certain people that I, I mean, I wouldn't say like they have laid the red carpet, but, but I felt welcomed and comfortable and people that I feel like I can trust. And I think that's that's something that's a little bit harder when you're a woman in this in this industry is is trust because you don't want to um, you don't want to align yourself with people that might take advantage or might um, you know try and and support you to make themselves look good mm -hmm. because there are people that will do that with women with people of color with you know it's it. it there's just going to be some of those people that will just say like, Hey, look, I'm supporting this person, you know, and it's right. for, Token. It's more yeah. for their image than for, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think that so far I've been fortunate to find people that are very genuine and, and like legitimately supportive. Um, and like I've had people that have been supported, supportive that are, you know, in the background that, don't want you know recognition so it so you know that they're just doing it to help you so um yeah i think that we are seeing a shift and and it's encouraging it's very mm -hmm. encouraging one person who laid out the red carpet for you is our friend thomas covert yeah. from the board game revolution community uh wanted to chime in i mean so not only do you have the board game mosaic project and you have a lot of different art projects and you know the board game art creations uh a project that you've started you are a mod for a very large, uh, you know, Facebook group. I mean, what are we talking over? 20, 25,000? 45,000. No, I'm old. I have, I have old Intel, 45,000 people. Uh, so you are, uh, so if that's a lot of people, I mean, it is crazy. Uh, so, and, and that, that exploded, right? That, that was like, uh, the numbers I'm going off of is like pre pandemic. We're talking like a year and a half ago. Well, and, like it is. And mm -hmm. I joined, 
I think I joined, it was in September of 2018 mm -hmm. is when I joined. And at that point, it was the 25,000 celebration because yeah. there was giveaways everywhere. And um, we joined the group. My husband and I were entering giveaways. And then we started, yeah, being on the group a little bit more and talking to other gamers and finding out about more games and then go down the rabbit hole of, you know, how many games are out there. And um, yeah, it was just, it, it was a really, really fun group of people. Like I was mm -hmm. having a great time on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so talk about being, talking about being an admin, being a mod, you know, um, interacting with, especially now, I mean, 25,000 and 45,000, that's a huge, di like 25,000 is a lot, but for a, a, a year, you're starting to get to the point where it's like, oh man, this is, uh, yeah. Oh, actually, I mean, I, I'm, I'm assuming that that's what it sounds like to me. I mean, tell me about your experience. It's, um, I mean, it still sometimes feels like a small group because you have people that will post, right. um, you know, daily or you frequent know, flyers <laughs> got plenty yeah, of that yeah frequent, yeah frequent flyers and so you recognize names and i mean you recognize names that are good people and you recognize games of uh, names of the people that are problematic so um i mean it's a it's a fine line um we tried not to you know censor people and we don't want to shut down everything that's you know controversial but at the same time we're also giving our time to monitor the group. So when we're in a period of time that's um, that has a lot of controversy or when there's issues come up in, in the industry that, you know, flare up and it becomes the hot topic, we have to somewhat limit, you know, how many posts will be about this issue because otherwise, yeah, like it just gets out of hand for us. Like you have to watch everything all day and then during the night when we have less mods that are around is when it gets challenging and things can get out of hand and so it's um i mean what what i enjoy the most i think is just interacting with our members and commenting on their posts and making them feel welcome yeah. and yeah just being being in the group posting fun stuff for people to answer or to you know and, now I post my art, so you know, fun stuff for them to look at. Um, I mean, the mod or ad admin duties are—it's definitely it. It requires a fair bit of your time, but um, I've been doing it for over two and a half years now. So it's, uh, yeah, it's 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 fun. We have our you know our group of mods are you know we're close, and we have our chats that you know we just talk about random stuff, and so it becomes like a group of friends. So it's. it's it's fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, is, do you feel like it's gotten harder over time? Um, well, yes and no. Because, I mean, yes, because of the group size. Um, and I think because, um, because of some of the shifts that have been happening in, in the industry in terms of, um, you know, the, the artwork in games, you know, the way that women are represented, um, trying to be inclusive and, and include more people of color and black people in your characters, in your games. So whenever there are games that are lacking in some respect, then it, you know, it can create posts that are um, heated. And that's when it becomes more work for us to manage, you know, letting people talk, but at the same time, then sometimes it gets disrespectful because it's the internet, right? Um, but at the same time, lately it's been easier for me just because I'm a little bit more busy with my stuff. So I've been able to give less time. Um, so I haven't been as involved, <laughs> but it's, uh, yeah, it's definitely, I mean, it's not an easy task, but that's why we have a team. We vote on, you know, when there are problematic things mm. that show up we have a group discussion and we vote on, okay, what do we do with this? Do we lock it? Do we remove it? Do, you know, do we need mm -hmm. to message the, the member? Like, so it's not like it's a one person show. Like it's, it's a group effort. You've probably learned a lot. <laughs> I, I do. A lot about how, how Facebook functions. Right. <laughs> when I look I, back yeah. at, 
I don't know. Like when I look back at when I started, I just I feel like I knew nothing about Facebook. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> at some point, I'm going to do a show on moderation. You know, like uh, just how people make those decisions, and I might have like a little panel of mods, and you know, because you have that that balance is tough, right? Because you wanted people to to express themselves, you want them to you know say things, but then again, like the most innocuous comment could be like troll bait. And it's like, you know, it could be, it could be this, this simplest sounding thing. And then all of a sudden it's like, rrr, 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 and then, they, and then, you know, so you end up removing it. And then the original person feels kind of butthurt. Well, it's like, what happened? I didn't do anything. It's like, it's not about you. Yeah. <laughs> Have you had that situation before? People are like, okay, what happened to my post? And yeah, I didn't well, say yeah. anything. Problematic I mean, and, yeah. yeah. Uh, and typically if a post gets removed, um, like a, a lot of the time, the person will get a message, you know, saying, okay. hey, sorry, we had to remove it. Like there are times where the post itself was fine, but just the comments went south. Right. And then it becomes a, okay, like either we're removing 60% of the comments because people, you know, decided to be rude today. Like it's probably full moon or something. Or <laughs> you just, you get weeks that it seems like everything happens at the same time. Um, it's usually where someone takes something personal. Yeah. Right. Like you, you so that's something when people start getting personal or they attack each other, or they insult right. each other. We remove that. It's just not the kind of right. environment that we want to have. Um, the thing that becomes problematic, I find, and and it's just something that social media and the internet and Facebook brings out is when something happens in the group in our group or another group. And then you end up seeing about it in a different group because people will go complain about my polls got removed or my comic got removed and I got silenced. And it's like, okay. This, this platform is so liberal. This platform I, is so conservative and they, they'll, they exclude my voice and it becomes like a huge <laughs> context thing. It's like, no, it's really not that. And it's that's just... the thing is that people have to remember that we have to sleep at night. We can't, we can't stay up 24 7 to monitor everything and the thing that happens is that there are certain things that if you leave it people will go tweet about it and say i saw this comment in this group <laughs> what did so you leave that one and... <laughs> obviously it's like this is the kind of comment we don't want to leave because it's right. problematic whether it's sexist racist like that it has to go um so we remove those and then people get angry if we leave it people get angry. So, so then, you know what I mean? Like yeah. it's it just, so yeah. we have to look at what makes sense, what aligns with our values as a team. Like, you can, you know, like we don't want to support racist comments. We don't want to leave se sexist comments. So, you know, like those are going to have to go like personal insults. It's going to have to go, but yeah, obviously you get people that think we're, you know, over censoring or whatever it is. But at the end of the day, it's like, what kind of environment do you want to foster for the group? And that's what matters. Right. So we can have the moderation. I mean, I may just have a dot, dot, dot TV continued. I like, <laughs> I like, I like pairing up my, uh, my conversations on shelf stories. Uh, so if you don't know, my channel is called shelf stories. It's a YouTube channel. I talk about all sorts of stuff. Uh, and I usually have like multiple conversations about stuff. Um, but yeah, let's let's just get back to you know uh, right you know back to Katia back to the project because we're wrapping up a little bit. Shannon Pepitone is is chiming back in and she asks, "What is your favorite game?" Oh, my favorite game is Five Tribes. Um, I think everybody knows what? that by now because I can, I know I love that game. The, the downtime the board game. Pardon? <laughs> downtime the board game. And that game is oh. if you play with three players or more, it is like. Because well, you have to look at the whole board, the whole, every angle. Oh, well, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. To me, <laughs> to me it, so, okay, first of all, we play it two players two more player. often than that not. Helps. And it's a great two-player game. Um, The other thing, too, is that I sort of, when I play that game, I don't plan ahead of time too much because things change so much that it's like I kind of keep an eye on what's happening, but realistically, there's no point in getting attached to a move I saw that is going to give me 12, 15 points until it comes back to my turn, because that's probably going to be all messed up by the time it gets to me. So it's a game where, yeah, you have to adapt quickly and you have to 
-hmm. yeah i don't know you just have to analyze and see it and and it's just it's my kind of game i just see it i look at the colors yep. and i and i count and i'm like okay if i go there da, 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 and it just i don't know it clicks Yep. And I like that there are different ways to score. There are ways to, you know, there's a little bit of take that, but not too much. Um, I don't know. The the way that you manipulate the the board with the meeples and dropping them places mm -hmm. and, and trying to create opportunities for your next turn, because sometimes you get two turns in a row, depending on how you bid. Like, that's just... To me, that's super clever. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. I have well, yet to I have yet to play a game that makes me as excited as I am when I play five tries. <laughs> so it's a great answer. It, yeah. To this day, it's still my favorite. It's a great answer for two players, and it's a great answer for that the people who process things artistically and the people who process things spatially, because it's all you know, it's all there to be ingested in a way like a, a Seven Wonders, right? So Seven Wonders, great game. But it, you know, cards and like, you know, square roots. <laughs> you can't see a square root. I don't get that. But like in five tribes, it's all there, right? It's all there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So I think uh, I think we're good. I think we're good. I think we're gonna wrap up the the conversation right here. This was so much fun. But we are gonna wrap it up because we're gonna begin. We're gonna end where we began. You have a project, and we need to reach a thousand backers. Like we, this I needs really, to happen. We, it does, and I mean, it's. It's very, um, sometimes it gets almost painful to like, you know, as a, as somebody who has a project on Kickstarter, like you're, you're watching your curve, you know, and like now I'm at the point where it's like, okay, I'm almost even yep. at where yep. we, where yep. we ended last year, but it's still like, we have a good upswing going. Um, I think we're past the mid campaign lull, you know, um, but it's it's really exciting to see like how things picked up yesterday and today and i mean like i on on the dice tower they gave you know they they mentioned my project they were super excited um you know like they they've always been really supportive of my art so i think that's helped and yep. i'm hopeful that maybe in a couple of days yeah we'll reach 800 and then maybe in the last 48 hours you know we'll shoot up to that 1000 but it would be really cool because yeah i have something that i would like to be able to give for <laughs> <laughs> she's <laughs> dying to talk about it people look at her she's dying to talk I about it <laughs> i'm like dangling it here but i don't want to say what it is i just i like to surprise people and that's what i did last year like last year i um for the backers i ended up including like a button with one of the pieces of art and i just sent that out and i didn't tell people and um yeah i don't know i just like to do that so i'm just putting it out there that if we reach a thousand i'm gonna put a little something in <laughs> gonna deliver absolutely <laughs> Yeah. Katia Howitson, you are going to be encountered on BGA uh, or, or BGR, I should say. There's a lot of BGs. <laughs> uh, Board Game Revolution community. Uh, this is Shelf Stories. We'll be posting this uh, uh, post fact after the stream on my channel. I'll release on Sunday, also in the One Stop Co op Shop podcast. So we are going to do our best. You know, we're no dice tower over here, <laughs> but uh, no, we're going to try. You don't know, like what you do, your channel is amazing. And well, thank you. I, I appreciate it. I, the videos that, you bring the conversations that you bring up are so important and um the first one that i watched just like pulled me right in and the i i just find that the way that you bring up the issues are it's respectful it's well thought out and it creates a conversation versus just you know pushing firebomb down. here we go ah here's my view yeah, <laughs> yeah so yeah. it's I mean, it, what you do is different from the dice tower, but it's it's no less important. So, well, that's not going to matter when it comes to getting those thousand backers. So, <laughs> <laughs> let's let's go. We got to focus over here. Focus, people. One thousand backers. Uh, board game. Uh, mo board game mosaic calendar live on Kickstarter right now. The project is ending on Thursday, June twenty fourth. Uh, so it is not that much time. But if you're watching this after June twenty fourth, there will be a late pledge period. Uh, Katia promises that she'll get on researching how that all works. And, <laughs> and well, it's yeah, it's because I'm using I'm I'm gonna be using a different platform for the pledge manager, so I just have to, yeah, I just have to put it together. <laughs> it's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> Katia, I'm gonna try and have it ready so that it's it's ready for if people miss out, then they can like pledge right away. 
KT Howitson, thank you so much for giving time to Boarding Revolution community and all the outlets within which this will appear. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Well, thanks for having me. If you could change your mind, you could change the world, people. So until next time, later, everybody. Bye.